Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name's Scott Lee, and I am an alcoholic and uh, overwhelmed alcoholic. What an honor it is to be here. Wow. Okay. Can y'all still see? I can't. I'd uh, like to thank Bob and everyone else who was involved in, uh, in putting this thing on and make it possible for me to be here. I am, I am truly honored beyond my ability to explain. I like to, uh, I like to open anything I do in recovery with a quotation from Lois Wilson, who was asked one time what she did in the moment of silence, and she said, I invite God to the meeting. And uh, it's not that I don't believe God's here. I do believe that. But I get a special gift when I stop and honor that presence. And uh, my, uh, my mentor, who died about a year and a half ago, who many of you knew, said that he had learned to treat God like a gentleman. And gentlemen don't go where they're not invited. And they don't stay where they're not made welcome. And uh, the other thing I do in the moment of silence is I ask God to help me not judge the speaker. Now, you don't have to do that, of course. But uh, that's made meetings better everywhere I've gone. And uh, so if you would... Uh, Humor me, I'd like to have another moment of silence, and let's just acknowledge the presence of deity and ask for open hearts. I'll just meet you back here in a second. Amen. Thank you. Now, if there's a bad talk, we know whose fault it is. I'm, I'm off the hook. I, uh, <laughs> I, am, uh, I am absolutely not an expert on this, and um, the, the format that I'm going to use is I'm going to talk about how I coach a new man through this portion of our work. It's what's been shown to me. This is simply my experience, which is what I've been asked to share. And uh, I I think there are an awful lot of wonderful ways to follow the instructions in the big book. So I'm I'm not near as hung up on format as I appear to be, but I think it's important for the new guy to to get some very specific instruction. If your sponsor uh, thinks I'm wrong and he's right, I agree with your sponsor. I believe God blesses sponsorship, and uh, and I think that's one of the one of the absolute formats of the I mean a foundation stone of what we do here. The uh, my sponsor told me when I was newly sober, he said I'm going to give you the two best kept secrets in AA. I said okay, what are they? He said the first one is the definition of our program, and the way we keep that secret is you read it at almost every meeting. It's on page 59 where it says, here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. So according to my sponsor, the steps are not part of the program. They are the program. No steps, no program. And uh, I've been around a, a short time compared to a lot of folks in the house, but in, in my few years, I haven't seen anybody in and out of the program yet. I've seen a few thousand in and out of the fellowship. It's been my experience that those who... Thank you, yeah. And I could sit down now because I think that's the most important thing I'm going to say. But um, <laughs> I haven't seen anybody do the work out of this book while being coached with it by a sponsor who's already done the work out of this book and stay stay uh, active carrying our message and drink again. Has anybody here seen that? I don't see too many hands on that. No. I'd say we as a group this morning stand by the first line in Chapter 5. Rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. He said the... Uh, and, and by the way, I was honest with my sponsor. I'd like to recommend that if you're new. I said, Jerry, I don't, I don't want to do the 12 steps. And he said, that's okay. I said, good. He said, as long as you do them. And uh, I said, Jerry, I don't believe we're communicating. And he said, yeah, we are. That's the definition of willingness. Willingness is when I do what my sponsor says, whether I want to or not. And uh, that was an important one. He said, the other best-kept secret in our fellowship is the fact that the four-step directions are cleverly concealed in the book. They're actually right in here. And um, he said uh, what what we were going to do was we were going to follow them one at a time in order and see what happened. He told me um, on step four, he said, all that garbage in your past is not who you are, that's who you're not. And what we will teach you here is how to stop doing who you're not. How to repair the damage for doing who you're not. How to receive the forgiveness for doing who you're not. And who you really are will just kind of emerge from the ashes like the phoenix. This this program is kind of like going to the dentist. We've got to drill before we can fill. 
And we're going to have to dig the poison out of your soul because we just fill with the good stuff. The poison's still in there. It's going to detonate one of these days. And uh, I was also told that God forgives me for everything I ever did, and he loved me while I was doing it. My God got bigger that day. And, and the other one that is so important to me is that, that I don't have the power to make a mistake so ugly that he can't turn it into something magnificent. Not, not just fix, but turn it into something magnificent. I, I watch him regularly taking the worst things I've ever done and using them as tools to help other people. That's a powerful program, powerful God. So I was, I was asked to talk on, uh, on the, port, the beginning portion of step four this morning. This is my experience beginning at the bottom of page 63. So the, the setup is that this new fellow I'm sponsoring, that he and I have completed together steps one, two, and three following the book. And coming up off of our knees from the third step prayer, I like to say to him, you'll hear raging in the fellowship the discussion as to when to do a fourth step. And you'll hear some people say, don't do a fourth step too soon, you may drink. I personally never have seen that. I've seen several thousand way too late. Um, if, if you're new, and I don't think there are very many new ones here, but if you're new and the steps look like they're designed to punish you, welcome to AA. <laughs> That's how they looked to us, and we were wrong about that, and you are too. And that, that what the steps would do was to bring me relief. And, uh, the, and I do this very playfully, okay? <laughs> the book is not specific about when to do a fourth step. It makes two time references. And I believe if the book gives leeway, I should give it as a sponsor. So I will allow them to start their four step on either one of those time references or anything that lies between. Does that seem fair? I think it is. So I ask him to begin at the bottom of page 63 at the end of the third step. And I ask him to read out loud and I'll interrupt. He says, next, I say, whoa, that's a time reference. So we're coming up off of our knees. And the first reference to when to do a four step is next. <laughs> It says, we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Our decision, that would be the third step decision, that God's going to be in charge and that suits me, was was a vital from the Latin vita, meaning necessary to life. All right, so this is only for the ones that want to live. Everybody else can take the morning off. (laughs) Was a, a vital and crucial step. It could have little permanent effect unless at once. That's a time reference. So following step three, the fourth step has begun either next or at once or anywhere in between. I give them all the leeway the book gives them. I think it's fair. Let's at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of. Isn't that interesting? Be rid of. In step four, we're going to be rid of. And it tells us that twice on this page. I think it's important when the book's redundant. I think it's important. And twice on this page, me tell me we're going to be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. Because that's the good news. The good news is I'm the problem. That's what he told me. He said, this is the best news you're ever going to get. You're the, you're the problem. I said, I don't get it. Why is that such good news? He says, because if it really is the cops, the courts, the judges, the blacks, the Chinese, the Russians, the PTA, the neighbors, and the ex-wife, you're cooked, son. <laughs> if they're the problem, this game is over and you lost. The good news is that you are the problem. And if you'll bring some willingness to this party, we can work on that. So in step four, we're going to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. I would observe if in step four all I do is write, I'll get rid of time, ink, and paper, and none of those are blocking me. So there must be things other than writing involved in step four. And he said that was where the power was, was that the other than writing portions of step four. And uh, skipping down a little bit, a business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Most of the businesses that I deal with do a computer update every night. And for me, that's the evening half or even portion of step 11 where they do a review. But at least once a year, they do a full teardown inventory. And I think that's the reference that it makes. And I wish I could say I'd done one a year for my 22 years. I think I've done about 17. I'm, I'm overdue right now. And it says uh, it's an effort. To, it's a uh, fact-finding and fact-facing process, an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. One object is to disclose damaged or saleable goods to get rid of. There it is again. They tell me twice on this page, and in step four, I'm going to get rid of promptly and without regret. It says, we did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup, which caused our failure. There's the good news again. I'm the problem. It says, being convinced itself, manifest in various ways of what had defeated us, we considered its common manifestations. And I like to give them kind of an overview. The manifestations of self that the fourth step in the text covers are resentment, fear, and sexual misconduct. And uh, I claim there's not a sex inventory in the book because I don't find the direction in there that says 
at this point, let's explore all the things in the sexual arena that you did that you thought were right and good, because there are some of those. So we inventory only the dark side of that, and I don't like the idea of sex having a bad name. It's my favorite toy. I mean, really. Let's... <laughs> and as uh, I'm sure Charlie's going to cover later on today, there are a lot of prayers in step four about sex, so it's okay to talk to God about sex. He's the one who invented it. Nice job. And... Uh... <laughs> You know, and I say that lightly, and the truth is I mean it. <laughs> and uh, Continuing on page 64, it says, Resentment is the number one offender. Uh, I'm told that the word resent comes from the Latin. The R-E, re-prefix, means again. So, for example, I reread something. It's something I do another time. And centiri means to feel. And so resent means, in effect, to feel again. And what we feel again is old anger. He told me the only way to get a resentment is to judge someone, find them guilty, be angry with them, and then feel that anger again. It is that feeling again of old anger that is resentment by definition. It says it destroys. It destroys. I love the power in the words. More alcoholics than anything else, from it stem all forms of spiritual disease. For we've been not only mentally and physically ill, we've been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. It makes me think the spiritual is the most important one. And so what, what I like to do at this point is explore with him, and we're going to look for directions, very specific things that we can do, and we're going to do them one at a time. I think the fourth step is very easy if we spoon it. It's kind of long, but it's real easy. And there, there are no surprises on it. I mean, you're the one who did all this stuff. It's not like there's a surprise coming here. It says, in dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. To me, that's not really so much a, a direction. It is a, a sort of an overview because they're going to tell me exactly how to set it on paper. It says, we listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. So what we need now is a list. And a list is a series of words and phrases that run down a page. I don't believe I've ever seen a list that ran across a page. Lists are vertical. They go down the page. And uh, I confused myself. That's easy. There's a lot going on in here. Uh, what I'm going to ask him for now is I'm going to ask him for some commitments. I'm going to ask him to commit to, in this program, doing the things that the people in the book did. If they say they wrote something, I'm going to ask him to write it. If they say they prayed something, I'm going to ask him to pray it. If they say they observed something, I'm going to ask him to stop and endeavor to observe it. He may or may not be able to, but I'll settle for effort on that part. And there are, interestingly enough, 168 hours in a week. If he has a... a an eight-hour-a-day job, five days a week, and a 30-minute commute, that's 45 hours. If he's in bed eight hours a night, that's 56 more. If he goes to seven meetings a week, that's about 15 more hours with a little drive in time, and let's get there early and stay late. Three hours of recreation, two hours for mowing the lawn and doing his melon list, you know, honey, do this, honey, do that. Five, five hours reading spiritual literature, uh, three hours bathing and shaving, taking care of himself, four hours date with a wife if he's fortunate enough to still be sleeping in the big bed, um, <laughs> or, uh, or maybe coaching Little League, something like that, five hours on the phone with me and some other men that I'm going to nominate, um, 13 hours shopping for food, clothing, cooking, eating, five hours in prayer and meditation, nine hours of television, that's a max, that's three ball games, that's plenty. Or two rounds of golf. That that I just read adds up to 165 hours out of 168 hours in a week. He's got three hours left. I want half. And, and it varies. I, I sponsor a fellow who, when we got to this portion of the work, his wife had a fabulous job. And he was a stay-at-home dad with a one-year-old. And his son took a nap from 1 until 3 o'clock every day. I want 10 hours a week from him. I don't see why I can't give them. But, but let, we negotiate that. I, I don't want to manage anyone's life. Step one, section B says I can't manage my own life. If I can't manage mine, how could I possibly manage his? But what I need to do is know about him. So uh, another guy has got a wife and five kids and two and a half jobs, a whole different thing for him. I personally believe that recovery shouldn't have a negative impact on any other aspect of my life. It should be inconvenient at times, but it shouldn't hurt me anywhere else. So I need to know a little bit about it. And when I set out to do my first four-step, what I did was I gave myself the assignment of completing the four-step, put me in perfect position to hate myself until it was done. Far, far better, I have found, to sit with a new man, learn about his life, come up with a number of hours per week, 
Every Sunday, I've got a fellow in four step right now. He, he calls me every Sunday afternoon. If he doesn't get me, he leaves the message as to when he's going to do his four step this week. This man is doing four 45 minute periods a week based on what he and I know about his life that made sense to both of us. And he can feel good about himself while he's in progress. I think we hated ourselves long enough. And, uh, and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is not a schedule. Monday from 8 p.m. until 8.30 p.m., that is a schedule. And like anything else on the schedule that's important, it's, it's not subject to cancellation. It's subject to being moved. Oh, I forgot the kid had a Little League game. We'll go to the game and do it later in the day. I don't even need a phone call on that. But, but let's feel good about ourselves while we're in progress, and let's talk about it. I think it's important to do it that way. Um, the other thing, I do this really tongue-in-cheek, okay, but I also mean it. I usually ask him at this point, I said, are you wondering what color ink you should use and what color paper? About half of them say, yeah. <laughs> Page 67 says, when we saw our false, we listened, we placed them before us in black and white. That's not very specific. That doesn't say white paper, black ink. That could easily be black paper and white ink. And um, I have sponsored two men who went to the, to the art store and bought an inch thick of black paper and bought two pens and wrote white ink. And, uh, and I want you to know, I think that sounds absolutely insane. And I insist on it. <laughs> um, and it, and, and it's just, it's, it's an attitude, really more than anything, that whatever the book says, we're going to do it. Because the first time I let myself off the hook on a detail, it could have been the one that would have saved my life. So I want you to know, I think that's absolutely insane. And, and I do require it. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, <laughs> and the other thing I like to tell them too is that you're not going to do the perfect four step. And I don't want him to think of this as his fourth step. This is his first fourth step in my lineage. Now, I know there, there are folks who do the first nine steps once and then say sober 10, 11, 12. And, boy, if that's what your sponsor's got you doing, it's working. I'm cheering loudly, and I mean that. But that's not the way it was shown to me. Because between six months and a year from now, he's going to be taking a newcomer through these steps himself, and I'm going to expect him to go with him. And so let's, let's stay involved. So we're not, this, you're not going to do the perfect fourth step. And I tell him, say, we are not saving a special alcove in Akron at the AA Hall of Fame for your four-step. And uh, as a matter of fact, our home group does not get a tr- give a trophy every year for the best four-step, and this is the trophy you're not going to get. I don't know if you can read it back there. It says, four-step trophy never awarded. That's what it says right here, okay? This is the trophy you ain't getting. <laughs> Have your picture made with us later for a couple of bucks. And, uh, <laughs> But I'm trying to, trying to give him permission to do it imperfectly because if I have to do it perfectly, I can't do it at all. Cannot do it at all. And, uh, my, what I suggest to him is to get a, to go down to the drugstore and get a spiral notebook. It's a fairly easy way to do this thing. Uh, open the inside cover and write something like, this is my four step. If I find you with it, I will kill you and hide your body. Something subtle, but that gets the point across. <laughs> and then, uh, and then let's turn to the inside, and this double page is one page. We write a one at the top of the left-hand margin, a two in the middle of the left-hand page, three and a four on the right-hand page. And, um, and again, I say I think there are a lot of right ways to do this. It's just what I do. And uh, I ask him to sit for, let's call it 30 minutes at a time to do this. I want the first five minutes in prayer and meditation. You invite God into your process. Ask him to give you clarity of mind to find what he'd have you find and the courage to write it down. And then let's begin with a list of your resentments. And what we need here is direction one says we listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we are angry. I want everybody and everything you have ever been angry with, ever, even if you're sure you've already forgiven them. No problem. Put them down. And the format is write a name, skip a line, write a name, skip a line, write a name, skip a line. You get to the bottom of the page, turn the page, because we're going to need this other side over here for some other stuff. Uh, For those who have cheated and looked ahead and know that the second direction has to do with what they did, and you want to save seven pages for your father, the answer to the question is write a name, skip a line, write a name, skip a line. Those were not estimates. Those were exact figures. Because we're not going to feed this resentment. And and what I like for them to do is, is to just spit them. In the first session, just as fast as you can think of them. When they slow down, there's an, there's an indication on page 65 says we went back through our lives. So that indicates a reverse chronology that we begin with today. Okay, I'm living at this place. I work at this place. I'm, I'm, I'm married to my lovely wife and I, this is my home group and this is my church and this is so on, so on, so on, so on. But 10 years ago, I was living in the other place and I was married to, uh, and, and so on. 
and then before that I lived in this other place, and before that I was in the Air Force, and they had me stationed at this place and that place. Before that I was in college and high school, and go all the way back to your earliest memories. When we get to the earliest memories, we're through with column one. Is it complete? No. No chance at all. But it's as complete as it's going to get. And we're not trying to buzz through this thing. We're trying to be as thorough as we can to get you through it once, to get you some relief, to dig this. Because what I was told is what we're going to do here is we're going to dig poison out of my soul. And and the fourth step, I believe, is where that process begins. So having followed that process so many hours a week, however, he and I can agree to it. And I'm real easy on that. I, I really am on the front end. <laughs> Don't call me later and tell me you couldn't work it in last week. I can't work with you. I can't help you. I'm a one-trick pony. It's a pretty fabulous little old trick. <laughs> I just got the one. And um, I have not been able to help anyone who wouldn't do the steps. Hadn't been able to help one of them. When we get to the earliest memories, we're finished. And I ask him at this point to begin to carry uh, paper and something to write with all the time. Because you're going to be walking through the grocery store. You're going to look at the cantaloupes and say, oh, his head looked just like this. Write it down. We'll add it to the end of the list. All right. We'll just stay in process here. And completing that, it says, in the next sentence, it says, we asked ourselves why we are angry. That's going to be column two. I'm looking at the example on page 65. It says, I'm resentful at Mr. Brown, the cause. His attention to my wife, told my wife of my mistress, Brown may get my job at the office. I asked him to count those words on Mr. Brown. There's 19 words there. I said, listen to this. Mr. Brown is messing with his wife, has told his wife about his girlfriend, and is trying to get him fired. He got 19 words. 19 words. And 19 is the limit. 19 is maximum. It's not optimum. It's maximum. It, it, my second column says things like, left me for another guy. Uh, next to high school, high school football coach, didn't play me as much as I deserved. Uh, left me for another guy. Uh, screwed me in a business deal. Left me for another guy. Uh, <laughs> It, uh, it doesn't start out. It was a rainy Wednesday afternoon. Uh-uh. No, no, no. We're not going there. Because <laughs> that just tends to feed the resentment. So we work vertically. We work down the page. The, I think there are two really good reasons. The best one first is the book says list, and lists run down the page. The second one is my experience is that if, if I work across the page, it tends to feed the resentment. If I work down the page, it tends to be a whole lot more analytical. That's just been my experience with it. When it completes column two, we then look at column three. Because what I discovered, if I show him the first three directions first, he's going to work across the page. We're Americans, and we work left to right. We don't work top to bottom. So I feed it to him one at a time. It's just what I do. Page 65 on our grudge list, we set opposite each name. Our injuries, was it our self-esteem, security, ambitions, personal, or sex relations have been interfered with? Column three, five-part multiple choice. Some will only get one. Some will get three or four. Some will get all five. Some you may not be able to figure out on your own. Call me. I'll help you see why it was self-esteem. And I don't tell them that, but on the first one, it's, it's, it, that bat's real close to a 1,000. On the first, My last two were the only two inventories I've ever had where self-esteem didn't get the most ink. The last two, it was security. Really surprised me. I, I can't wait to get to the next one. Uh, I am waiting. Uh, <laughs> so that's column three. And then, then for me, I think some of the most powerful portions of our step work lie between the third and fourth, third column and whatever you do with that other paragraph uh, on page 67. I use a fourth column. I think there are a lot of other really good ways to do it. But for me, the action in this part of the step lies between those two and the observations and prayers that I find to be life-changing. I, I don't know that the writing portion of step four has any therapeutic effect. I don't think it ever has on me. But the observations and prayers are life-changing. And by observations, I don't mean what I happen to notice as I came zipping by. But I mean the things that it tells me to observe, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk about those as long as I have time here. Page 65. We went back through our lives. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. Isn't that interesting? We considered it carefully. For me, that's a general description. It tells me exactly how to consider it. He says, the first thing apparent was that this world and its people were often quite wrong. I don't like to let them spend a lot of time on that particular one. I mean, let's be honest about it. You've been sitting on bar stools with the other great philosophers of our era doing this for decades. So we pretty well got this one in place. Let's, let's kind of move on. So to conclude others were wrong was as far as most of us ever got. Usual outcomes, we, people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Is that true for you? Is that what happened to you? The usual outcome, uh, I'm sorry, 
Sometimes with remorse, we were sore at ourselves. That was the worst one for me. I hated hating me. It says the more we tried to fight and have our own way, the worse matters got. Was that your experience? Maybe that's why we quit fighting anything or anyone. As in war, the victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. Was that your experience? And then it says it is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. They observe that, do you? Have you ever seen a life that was that was full of resentment and was also happy, joyous, and free? Have you ever seen that combination in anyone? Not just you. Have you ever seen it? And and what we are, we're, we're beginning what looks, I'm a sales rep. And what we have here in the next couple of paragraphs is, I think, maybe the finest sales presentation I have ever seen. So what we're doing is we're selling you something here. So let's explore the details. He says, to the precise extent that we permit these, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? Squander means to throw away with no help of any, getting anything good out of it. Did you squander hours that might have been worthwhile? Did you lay awake at night and hate them? Did you sit in class and plan what you were going to do to them instead of uh, listening to what the teacher had to say? Did you squander hours that might have been worthwhile? Let's talk about that. It says, but with the alcoholic whose hope, now they're going to tell me what my hope is, is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience. To me, growth means two things. One thing it means is that Scott Lee's 2006 program just might not be good enough to keep him sober in 2007, that I must continue to be in the growth path. I'm sorry, that's what growth means. Maintenance is two things. Um, one is that I can't afford to lose anything I've already got. But maintenance in the sense that I maintenance my vehicle, I, I line the front end, I keep the right pressure in the tires, I put the right grade of gas in it, I change the oil, I vacuum it, I wash it. I maintenance my spiritual program. I open my day with prayer and meditation. I read a couple of pages in the big book and some other spiritual literature. I, uh, I do morning meditation with my wife. I attend a lot of AA meetings. I have the privilege and honor of taking meetings into correctional facilities and treatment centers. Uh, I'm married to a fabulous woman. Many of you know Miss Linda. I act like it all the time. I make no exceptions to that. I've got some kids. I'm trying to be a great dad today. I've got some grandkids. I'm trying to be a great grandfather. Um, I drive a vehicle. Put your blinker on near me in traffic. I'll let you in. It's one of the most spiritual things that I do because I'm a type A. And uh, <laughs> you put your blinker on around me in traffic. I will let you in. So I maintenance my spiritual condition in that sense. So that's what it's telling me here. So that's my hope. It says, but with the alcoholic whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. Infinitely grave. <laughs> wow. Uh, I think we've just threatened your life. I think we're going to do it a lot on this page. That was once. We found that it is fatal. That's twice. I... Um, I hadn't seen the man that took me through these steps in several years, and I ran into him at the 202 Club in Nashville. And I, I, I went up to him, and I said, Jerry, I'm scared. And he said, sit down, let's talk. And I said, do you remember? And I named a man. And he said, if you ever have anyone that you sponsor commit suicide, you'll always remember them. And I said, Jerry, I can't find the difference between me and this guy. When, when we were, he and I were both sober two years, we were plus or minus maybe 60 days on the same sobriety date. We had the same home group where I saw him five to eight times a week. We had the same sponsor, you. And he drove home two years sober from a meeting one night, pulled in the garage and dropped the door and left it running and took his own life. And I can't find the difference between me and him, and I'm scared. And Jerry said, I could not get him to do a fourth step, and I believe he died of resentment. And I thought about that, and I've talked to others who knew this man in that era, and we all agree. This man died of resentment. He, he would not do a four-step. He would not go through the forgiveness process. And he couldn't wait every time you saw him to run up to you to tell you what some SOB had just done to him. He was the, he was the permanent victim. And it's been my experience that the victims don't tend to get sober. That I have to step out of that victim role. And we're going to talk about how to do that in a couple of minutes. So I agree with Jerry's analysis. We've just threatened your life twice. We found it's fatal. For when harboring such feelings, interesting word, it doesn't say when having such feelings. It says harboring. Harbor means to give a safe place to, to nurture. I think I'm okay if I have a resentment if I'm not harboring it. They're going to tell me how to not harbor in a couple of minutes. It says we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns. We drink again with us to drink is to three. If we were to live, okay, we're back only for the ones that want to live. All right, so we just, we just threatened your life again. We had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm are not for us. 
About the time this book was being written, a very creative man named Walt Disney sat his staff down around a table and came up with a way to write Mickey Mouse cartoons where they'd spit out ideas and your idea would remind him of something, that would remind him of something, and they'd kick it around like that. And he labeled his process brainstorming. And I looked up brainstorm in a dictionary that was printed in the 1930s, and the definition said transient violent mental outburst. Yeah, we know that is rage. It has absolutely nothing to do with creativity. And, and I, I, think it, I think it's important to understand what the words mean here. I think dictionaries are important. So this doesn't have anything to do with creativity. Brainstorm is synonymous with rage. It says the grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. So the grouch for me is a slow burn, and the, and the rage is the deton- and the brainstorm is the detonation. It's, and I love this sentence. You want something thin? Listen to this. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men. But for alcoholics, these things are poison. Yeah, yeah, this will just kill you is all. It says, uh, it says, we turn back to the list for it held the key to the future. Pardon me, does that mean if I don't find the key to the future, I don't have a future? Yes, sir. That's exactly what that means. We just threatened your life one more time just for practice. It says, we were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. Different from what? Well, the last time we looked at the list was actually at the, begin- at the bottom of the preceding page where it said the first thing apparent was that this world and people were often quite wrong. We haven't looked at the list since then. We've been doing some analysis of resentment, what it is, what it does. And then it says, strangely enough, I thought I was going to say, now we're going to look for my part. never says that. I think that's one of the most popular misquotes. I think there's a major difference between looking for my part and doing what it said over here on this next page. It says, we began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. So let's go back and look over this thing a little bit and see how you're dominated. Let's take a 30-minute session and have a look. How does this dominate you? Did your father beat you down to the point where at 63 years old you still have trouble with authority figures? That's my story. Um, did, did you plan your life so that you'd never be around these people so they couldn't get you again? Did you plan your life so you'd be around them as much as you could so if they'd made a mistake you could make sure everybody knew about it? Let's have a look and see how did these things dominate you? What happened? That's what it asks us to do here. It says, in that state, the wrongdoings of others, fancied or real. Does that mean some of this only happened in my own head? Yeah, that's what that means. I'm sorry. It had the power to actually kill. I, I sponsored a guy that had the California Highway Patrol down on his list. All of them. And uh, <laughs> as we did some analysis, he, he said, I, I don't think I have a resign. I'm, I'm okay with him. Again. I said, no, you, you resented him. I mean, they, he says, well, it occurred to me that if I hadn't been driving that fast and all over the road, they probably wouldn't have stopped me. And if I hadn't taken a swing at that first one, they probably wouldn't have beat me up. I, I said, okay, we'll let that one go. <laughs> Fancied or real. It says, how could we escape? That's a good question. We saw that these resentments must be mastered. Do you? We just threatened your life seven times on this page. Was that sufficient? Uh, a good salesman will never, ever mention price until he's established value. Never. We just threatened your life all over the page. Was that sufficient for you? Are you convinced that it does not matter what the price is, you're going to have to pay it? I hope so, because the price is kind of high. <laughs> it says we could not wish them away any more than alcohol. This was our course. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. My mentor defined spiritually sick as cut off from God. And I asked them, and I asked you, think of the one or two worst things you ever did. I'm not going to call anybody. Think of the one or two worst things you ever did. I know there are a lot in the room who wouldn't mind being called on because they've gotten free. Weren't you spiritually sick to have done those things? I mean, spiritually healthy people don't do that kind of stuff, do they? See, I've got something the angels don't have. I have the ability to turn my back on God and go right back to doing it my way. And that's what I was doing when I did those things that are the ugliest in my inventory. That's what I was doing. And uh, one of my other mentors did it this way, the word realize. He said, I realized I can know something, but when I realize it, it becomes real for me on a different level. It's what my wife calls heart knowledge. And I think the other thing with that word is I begin to see it with my real eyes. Not these, but my spirit eyes. And I must realize that the people who wronged me were perhaps spiritually sick. It's the beginning of forgiveness process. And what I ask them to do is to sit down and one at a time, first in that five-minute period, to invite God in for clarity and so on. And then to talk to God about the two or three worst things you ever did. Talk to him about them and how you crave his forgiveness and how spiritually sick you were to have done those things. And I think it puts you in a good frame of mind to then go down that list one at a time and do the simple prayer. 
First name on the list, Fred. God, help me see that Fred was not an SOB. He was just spiritually sick. Pardon me, just spiritually sick. Grant me those spirit eyes to be able to see that. Second name on the list, Mary. God, help me. And just pray the list once. Top of page 67. Though we did not like their symptoms and the way these disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. The symptom of their spiritual sickness is whatever they did that left me with a resentment. The way they disturbed me is my resentment. And then the great truth is so important, they told me twice in two sentences. And I, I, and I, think, I think the message screams at me when it's redundant. They, like ourselves, were sick too. I've, I've got to grant myself spiritual sickness too. And it says, we ask God, that looks very much like a prayer to me, we ask God to help us show them the same tolerance and pity and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. For I have now acknowledged that they're sick. They're not evil. They're not bad. They're simply sick. Um, many of my mentors got sober on the second edition, some on the first. And uh, I have very prayerfully approached this. And this is hard for me right now. Um, I think one of my favorite misquotes in the, uh, about the big book is more will be revealed. I can't find it. I know it says God will constantly disclose more to you and to us, page 164. And I refer to the story section as more will be disclosed. And, uh, and I believe it has been. And uh, this is page 551. And uh, this is the part some of my mentors go another way on, and I understand that. I was asked to share my experience, and this is the hard part for me. Bottom of page 551, Freedom from Bondage story. One morning, however, I realized I had to get rid of it. The it is a resentment against her mother that's been running her life. For my reprieve, if you look up reprieve, it's a stay of execution. This is another death threat. Reprieve was running out, and I didn't want to get... And if I didn't get rid of it, I was going to get drunk, and I didn't want to get drunk anymore. In my prayers that morning, I asked God to point out to me some way to be free of this resentment. During the day, a friend of mine brought me some magazines to take to a hospital group I was interested in. I looked through them, and a banner across one featured an article by a prominent clergyman in which I caught the word resentment. I'd like to observe the sequence of events. Item one, she sees something about herself that needs work, and I didn't say there's something wrong with her. I don't believe there's anything wrong with any of us. I think we're God's kids. I think there's some parts of us that could use them. We're kind of like faceted gemstones. Some of the facets are already in really good shape and polished and cut well. Others could use some work. And, and I try to look at it that way. And more important than I try to look at you that way than me. I'm doing all right seeing me that way. But, uh, but, but the sequence of events is she sees something about herself that needs some work. She prays about it. Now, I like to add in talk to a sponsor that's not here. And then she gets focused helping someone else. And that prescription is all over this book that uh, nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. When i got a problem, I go help you. And, uh, and that's what she does, and her answer falls out of the sky on her. And I propose that that is a predictable sequence of events. See something about me that I don't like, that I think needs work. Pray about it, talk to my sponsor about it, and, get, and take a meeting into the jail and come outside and my answer is laying on the hood of the car. And I like to point that out with the men that I sponsor when I see the sequence because I believe it's predictable and I believe it happens all the time. And it says, he said, in effect, if you have a resentment you want to be free of, that's a good question. Did we make our sale? Do you want to be free of it? Are you in love with hating this thing? I I sponsored, (laughs) he's gone now, Big Ken Sweeney said when he got sober he hated everybody and he wished there was more of them. And... (laughs) I had never seen anyone more in love with resentment than that man was. And, uh, and we watched him get free. We absolutely watched him get free. He said, if you have a resentment you want to be free of, if you will pray for the person or thing you resent, you'll be free. If you will ask in prayer for everything you want to be, for yourself to be given to them, you'll be free. Ask for their health, their prosperity, their happiness, and you will be free. Even when you don't really want it for them and your prayers are only words and you don't mean it, go ahead and do it anyway. It goes on to say it'll work in two weeks. That has not been my experience. But uh, this lady was down to one living a pretty spiritual life, and you're starting with 409. I'm not expecting it to be over in two weeks. And, uh, and so what I'm going to ask them to do at this point is let's, let's stop right here and continue to do these 30 or 45-minute sessions, however many days a week, plus any time you're in the shower, any time you think of them when you're driving the car, I want you constantly in prayer. This is my experience, and for, forgive the, the editorial, but this is my experience. I don't have the power to forgive for me, the English language has that word wrong. It has it as a transitive verb, something I can do. I can give you this pen, but I can't forgive you. And what I have found is that when I forgive you, I haven't done something. I've received something. 
What this process is about is about me opening up to receive the gifts that have always been here. It's never been God's unwillingness to give. It's always been my inability to receive. And I think of resentment as ice around my heart. And the ice has a thickness based on how severe the events were and how long ago and how much I have nurtured them. And what we do here in prayer is hold the icy heart up to the sunlight of the Spirit. And sunlight will melt the ice. And I do this long enough, and eventually it melts. And I receive the gift of no longer hating you. So I haven't done something. I've received something. And uh, so I want to pray in the list. One, first name on the list, Fred. God help me uh, show Fred the same tolerance, pity, and patience. I would cheerfully grant a sick friend. And I also pray that uh, that he wins the Tennessee lottery. That, uh, that his kids go to school on scholarship and don't, don't ever give him any grief. That he gets promer- get, uh, promoted at work. That his wife is a fabulous lover. Um, that his... I'm mean, see going to see the hands of all the guys that don't want that. I mean, let's pray for what... <laughs> that, uh, that his lawn grows lush and green, but it grows so slowly he only has to mow it once a year. I mean, just don't leave anything in the bag here. That, you know, yeah. I mean, that he breaks 80 on the golf course, that he rolls a 300, anything you can think of that you'd like to have, you ask for it for him. And um, and didn't ask you to mean it. And I tell him, I say, if you need to preface these prayers by saying, okay, God, I don't mean a word of this, but that idiot that you've got sponsoring me right now said to me to do this, and I'm going to do it just to prove to him it won't work. Start there. I'm good with that. (laughs) I'm not offended by that at all. I didn't ask you to mean it. I asked you to do it. Uh, (laughs) There's a big difference. Didn't ask you to mean it. And, and you pray all that for Fred, and then you ask yourself a very simple question. I either mean that or I don't. It's not an essay question. This is yes or no. If you, if you mean it, if you don't mean it, move to the next name. Don't stay there. If you do mean it, put a check mark by it and go to the next name. And let's go all the way to the end of the list, and let's start again, praying only for the ones that don't have check marks. And I don't care how long this takes. If we've got something more important that we do, that I, that I, there's more important that I did, then stop hating God's kids. I don't know what it is. I mean, I claim I want to have a relationship with this God while I hate some of his children. Don't come to me to try to have a relationship with me, me knowing you hate my children. That's not going to work. That's absolutely not going to work. We we pray a prayer at the end of, of a lot of our meetings, and there's a phrase in it that says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. And I believe what that says is, God, if I don't forgive them, don't you forgive me. I believe that's exactly what my sponsor said. <laughs> he said to me when I got here, he said, what you wanted was mercy for you and justice for everybody else. <laughs> and he said, the package is mercy for everybody or justice for everybody, and you are part of everybody, and you get to choose. And I am not personally in a position to face justice, and I never expect to be. I have therefore chosen mercy for everyone. And this was the process by which that happened for me. And what I got was light. I don't know how I, I don't know how to explain that to you. My body isn't as heavy as it once was. Um, I smile more often than I ever did. I have a laugh that comes from a depth of soul that never did before while that poison was in there. And what's happened to me is that, is that poison has been dug out and I'm not angry anymore. And uh, editorial again, forgive me, but I've discovered the source of all anger, at least for me. And the source of all my anger is when I'm right. I have never been angry when I wasn't also right. I have been right when I wasn't angry. But I have never been angry when I wasn't right. And my being right implies judgment. And in step three, one of the things that I agreed to do is to stop playing God. And part of how I played God was I judged people. And I know I judged them because I had resentments and we went through that. It's the only way I can get one. And when I step out, when I was new, I was saying insane things like I'm having a good day or I'm having a bad day. Isn't that insane? I mean, think about it. When I say I'm having a good day, what am I really saying? I'm saying Scott's will is being done today. <laughs> when I say I'm having a bad day, what I'm saying is Scott's will is not being done today. And Scott's will is one of the biggest problems I've got. Or there are quite a few mistakes in the big book. It's one or the other. To get out of that business. Here's another gift from one of my mentors. He said, resentment is when I didn't get my will in the past. Anger and depression are when I'm not getting my will right now. And fear is the concern that I won't get my will at some time in the future. Oh, I hated that. 
it always comes back down to my will. So I ask them to continue to stay in prayer on this thing. And, and, uh, and I try to remind them, too, that in my own experience, prayer is not an opportunity for me to change God's mind. It's not a sales presentation, right? It's an opportunity for God to change my mind. Uh, uh, my, one of my closest friends in Nashville, some of you have heard Steve speak, he says his sponsor told him at six months, he says, I'm really happy that you want to serve God. I am sad, however, that you only want to serve in an advisory capacity. <laughs> Isn't that? I always want to be God's coach. And then, big fella, take a knee. And I, come, and, right? I go to him with his shopping list. And um, I, I, I had the privilege of flying for the United States Air Force for a number of years. And uh, uh, we were bringing a big uh, four-engine jet out of New Zealand. They've got a beer in New Zealand called Leopard Strong. I don't know about the Leopard. And um, we landed American Samoa about eight hours later and took on fuel, and we left Samoa for Honolulu on an eight-hour flight plan. About four hours into that flight plan, we get into the new fuel. It had water in it. At 35,000 feet, they don't call it water. They call it ice. It's minus 55 centigrade up there. And the ice freezes in the fuel lines and, and the engine's compressor stall. Jet engine, not so big. Kind of like a backfire in your car, only just a little bit more uh, important out over the water. And uh, so we can't maintain altitude, so we come down into the warmer air. And the engine's running pretty good down here, but we don't have gas to make Hickam at this altitude. Jet engines are much more efficient at higher altitude. So we climb back up in the compressor stall and we come back down. The very worst thing you can do for fuel is this. And it becomes clear to us very quickly that we're going to put a 300,000-pound jet into the Pacific Ocean today and that we are all going to die in that process. Many of us have had the experience of thinking we're going to die in the next few seconds. And we've, we've laid motorcycles down. We've been in head-on collisions. We look down the barrels of guns. Lots of us have had those experiences for a moment or two. But tell you something, four hours is a long time to think I'm going to die today. That's a long time. And I promise God, if he'd get me out of this one, <laughs> I'm going to quit smoking. I am going to quit drinking. <laughs> I'm going to quit spending the evening with ladies I'm not married to. I am going back to church. I, I believe I'll memorize the Bible. Uh, <laughs> and I am leaving nothing out of this. And uh, we got, uh, we're, we're showing blank on all of the gauges. And... Uh, we got closer and closer. It looked like we had them, and we have got a ditch and drill in process. And um, we finally decided we'd shoot a forced landing at Hickam, that if we could get to what we call high station on a forced landing, we could at least, this is the conversation in the cockpit, that we can at least crash on dry land and have our bodies sent home for burial. It's a conversation in a cockpit when you think you're going to die for four hours today. We, we turned final at Hickam at 9,000 feet. <laughs> and, uh, and when we taxied in and shut them down, uh, they dipped the tanks like you dip your crankcase in your, in your car to see how much oil you got. They dipped us. We did not have sufficient fuel left to crank four engines and taxi back to the runway. We did not have that much left. And I didn't even check into the quarters. I went straight to the officer's club back to the stag bar to the crazy end. And I set my bags down on either side of a bar stool. And I said, my tie, the big one, back of Marlboro's. I look back on it today, and this is my perspective. In those days, those few times that I prayed, I was trying to make him my God. What you all have taught me here is how to make me his man. I had it backwards. I had so, so, so many things backwards. And this fourth step for me is, is part of that process of making me his man. And I, I quote my wife who says, God's will, it's a good deal. Yeah, I got here terrified of God's will. I've been scared of it for a long time. Well, why did Grandma die? Well, it was God's will. <laughs> it sounds dangerous to me. <laughs> and then I got the other piece of it where, um, as a small boy, so you want that? Well, pray for it. Okay, I pray for it. Okay, if I get it, I was either skillful or lucky, and I forget that I prayed. If I don't get it, there's either not a God or there's a God, and he doesn't care about Scott. I got here with a lot of problems with this concept of God's will, and I had to take what those two words, God's will, meant to me and break them in half. The first half is things like, uh, what am I going to be when I grow up? Where am I going to live? How much money am I going to make? 
uh, what's going to happen to my children, uh, do the communists eventually take over the world, and all that stuff. stuff. Every bit of that violates one day at a time. And, and I now think of all of that as God's plan. Step one, section B says, I'm not management. Consequently, I don't need to know what plan is. Leaves me with God's will. And that's very simply what would he have me do today. Um, I open my day with prayer. One of the first things I do in the morning is I invite God in to run my life today, not give me some help. I was always afraid I was going to work God too hard. I tell you what, I'm going to cover sex and money. He can get the rest. No, no. <laughs> invite him in to run my whole life today. Um, Read some spiritual literature. Pray, meditate, take meetings into the jails and prisons. Act like a married man all the time. Try to be a good father. Uh, I'm a citizen, by the way. I vote. I'm going to say I vote, too. I vote by secret ballot. I hope you do, too. And I hope we don't ever cross that line anywhere near one of these places. We could kill somebody. It's really, really important that we, we stay what we are. We are single of purpose. That's important to me. I, I got that lesson. I was... Uh, Sober, uh, well, I hadn't had a drink in about two years. I was in the evangelical phase at about two years. And uh, <laughs> and I was standing in the old clubhouse a few minutes before a meeting one day uh, having a discussion with another AA member. Now, not being as spiritually evolved as I am, you might have thought it was an argument. And, um, <laughs> and old Joe B. walked in, and Joe had been, Joe was... Um, very intelligent and had been sober since several weeks before the earth began to cool. And which, which characteristic would clearly put him on my side of this burning argument, which at this moment I can't remember exactly what it was about. But anyway, as Joe poured his coffee, I posed the question. And I said, what do you think, Joe? And he said, I am not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Do not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse nor oppose any causes. My primary purpose is to stay sober. Help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. And by the time he got through with that, my opponent and I were laughing pretty hard. And it took me a pretty good while I had a revelation. You don't know what a revelation is? Revelation is when I figure out for myself something y'all been trying to tell me for six months or longer. <laughs> right? It's a revelation. <laughs> and I went to Joe and I said, you meant that? He said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and Joe was living the AA preamble. You could not draw him into controversy. He would not let anything get between him and carrying the message or him and staying sober. What a fabulous, fabulous example he was. Continuing on page 67, he gives me my marching orders from here on is how I read this. And it says, when a person offended, we said to ourselves, so this is a silent prayer. This is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. And then it says, we avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. And that's the truth, that we're back to the idea that these people who wrong me or offend me are spiritually sick. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. Isn't that powerful? Chance of being helpful. Boy, there that is again. Page 77, our real purpose. Have you noticed how they changed the big book? Like they add stuff that wasn't here the last time you read it? I think that should be a grapevine uh, art, uh, you know, a couple of pages every month on what they've added. Here's something they added about six months ago on page 77. Seems that way to me. It says, our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and the people about us. That fit ourselves is new. I thought my job was to be a maximum service, and it's not. It's to fit myself. It's, my work is always on me. Get closer to him, and then he can use me. I need to be the best tool I can be. That's my job. I don't need to work your case. I need to make sure I'm focused on mine. Page 67. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. Is that a promise? I mean, I get here hating like 300 people. Really, I mean, I'm looking for them to turn their backs. About 300. And God is going to show me how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one of them? Wow. It says, referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, I think that would be very difficult to do if I still hated them. And I think it's why it's so important for me to have continued to pray those prayers until I get cleaned out on that stuff. And until suddenly, all of a sudden, I'm not mad at these people that, that did some pretty tough things to me. It says, we resolutely look for our own mistakes. I think that's very, very different from looking for my part. If I'm looking for my part, it means somebody else has got a part. I got this from Bob. I don't see him here. I, he's, he, hey, Bob. 
Um, but I, I saw him do this one time, and, and this is, it was so true for me. I'm looking for my part. This is my part over here, right? Here's my part. When I'm looking for my part, somebody else has got a big part. It's not what it says. I'm looking for my mistake. Because if I've done these prayers, whatever they did has gone. I get clean on that. Where had we been? Selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened? There's a list that's all over this book. Um, I find it again here on page 84 in the 10th step. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. On page 86, were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? On page 88, we are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. Page 145, we have enemies, by the way. Page 145, the greatest enemies of us alcoholics are resentment, jealousy, envy, frustration, and fear. The list varied slightly, but it's the same thing all over. And my analysis of that is these are the earmarks of the reemergence of self. And it, it says to continue to watch for them and when they crop up. It doesn't say if. It says when. And it tells me what to do. So that's what I'm looking for. On page 67, where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened? Though a situation not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. They told me twice. That must be very important. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other, other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. I think there are a tremendous number of really good ways to do that. I like to do a fourth column inventory, because uh, use that as fourth column uh, for two reasons. One is what my sponsor said to do, and that's good enough. And, and the second one is because it sets up step eight very easily. Because when I get to step eight, all I've got to do is review that last column, and I can see where I owe amends to people. It says we placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly, and we're willing to set these matters straight. That does sound like step eight. And, and I think these things, the steps blend. I, I see that again later on in the fourth step, this, this willingness to admit my own faults and, and, to, uh, and to make amends where I possibly can. There's, I got sober, and so I now read the Roman numerals, which is something I never did before I got here. And there's a powerful thing here in the uh, forward to the second edition. Bill is about to leave the Oxford groups, and he, he's not taken everything that they gave him, but he's taken part of it. And it says, this is Roman numeral 16, though he could not accept all the tenets of the Oxford groups, he was convinced of the need for moral inventory, confession of personality defects, restitution to those harmed. That might be different from an apology. Helpfulness to others. There that is again. And this is the piece that floored me. It says the necessity. I wonder how important that is. The necessity a belief in and dependence upon God. And what strikes me is that the, there's the difference between belief in God and dependence upon God. Many of us get here believing there's a God and not having a higher power. That was my situation when I got here. I was terrified that there just might be a God because I was guilty as charged. And I needed a God. I didn't need a God who was forgiving. I needed one that was eager to forgive. And I needed to be the same myself. And I think that's what this portion of step four was about, was about my willingness in the beginning and eventually my becoming eager as, as I became less and less angry with other people that I, that I was changed. Um, I, I was at the mustard seed in Chicago a number of years ago, and a girl said, my priority is not what I say it is. My priority is what I do. If I want to know what my priorities are, I don't listen to my words about the future. I look at my actions in the recent past. What was accomplished was a priority. What was not accomplished was not a priority. And anything I say to the contrary is a lie that I'm telling me. And I hated that when I heard it. Because I was saying a bunch of things were priorities and I wasn't doing anything about it. And I've got, I've got three things that I call my, uh, today I call them my spiritual barometers. At, at two years sober, I was, uh, I was working on my character defects. That's a good way to get a brain hernia, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, you can hurt yourself doing that. And I was. And, uh, there were three of them, and they were um, lying, well, improvements on the truth, actually. <laughs> right? Lying, swearing, and uh, my attitude toward those of you who got your driver's licenses out of Cheerios boxes. And if, uh, yeah, and what I find, I was trying to stop all of that, and I was just hurting myself. And, um, and what I've discovered was that sometimes that stuff was there and sometimes it wasn't. And then I eventually discovered that if one of them was there, they were all there. And what I did was I inventoried my last few days or maybe my last week and asked myself, where are my spiritual holes? Uh, the one that I'm the most frequent with is I get away from morning meditation, and that makes me crazy. This past summer I went on a fairly long vacation, 
and I slept in instead of doing morning meditation. By the, excuse me, by the time I get back, I was, uh, I was literally on the way into a depression. I've got to have that. I have to have that quiet time in the Master's presence. And I get back to doing it, and three days later, I'm okay. And so I inventory, when I hear one of those things get out, if I look, they're all out. And I inventory my recent past. How long has it been since I took a meeting into a penal facility or a, or a uh, treatment center? That's really the same thing. Um, uh, what, what's my morning of prayer and meditation look like? Um, how much time am I spending with the men I sponsor? How long has it been since I called my sponsor? What, what am I, how much spiritual literature am I reading? How much focus am I having on trying to help other people? And if I look, there are holes. And I repair those holes. I fill those holes and go back to doing the things that you all have taught me. And three or four days later, you cut me off in traffic and almost hit me. And uh, and I will smile at you from the depths of my soul, and I'll wave at you, and I'll wave my entire hand, the whole thing. <laughs> and mean it, whole thing. And um, and I'll say, God, thank you so much that I spotted that he was going to cut me off and hit my brake, and that he and I weren't in an accident that would have been his fault, but I would have still been in an accident. Thank you. And by the way, please go with that one today. It looks like he could use some help. And I can't change me from the screaming maniac I was a couple of days ago. I can't. But when I do the things that you've taught me, uh, my sponsor explained it this way. He said, all of your character defects are self-centered. He said, there are no exceptions to that. Never. And self doesn't have the power to push self out of the center. If it did, it'd leave a vacuum. And so what we've taught me here is how to do the things to lead a God-centered life. When I go back and do those things, my character defects just recede. I don't take power over them. But they just recede, recede. I don't focus on the darkness. I invite the light in. And the darkness flees for it cannot exist in the light. I love you with all my heart. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.